Um, good evening. Uh, welcome to this uh, event on the EU, the US and the crisis in Ukraine. My name is uh, Adam Toos and it's my great pleasure to uh, be hosting this evening on behalf of the European Institute uh, and our collaborators, uh, the Harriman Institute, La Maison Française and Alliance. Uh, we're also extremely grateful to a grant from the European Union's uh, Getting to Know Europe program. Uh, which enables us uh, to put on a truly fabulous lineup of speakers this evening. Ambassador Pierre Vimont, uh, Senior Associate at RDD Europe, uh, Tariq Amar, uh, Professor in uh, History at Columbia University, and Alex Cooley, uh, Director of the Harriman Institute. And it's a real pleasure for the European Institute to be able to uh, put together a panel like this. Um, the distinction of our panel this evening is really, really quite remarkable, and uh, forgive me for taking just a few minutes to um, introduce you to uh, our speakers this evening. Uh, first, uh, and uh, uh, foremost, <laughs> uh, Ambassador uh, Pierre Vimont, who is truly a legendary figure uh, of French uh, and European uh, diplomacy. Um, a, a figure with really incomparable experience in both European and transatlantic uh, diplomacy. Uh, having been uh, a major figure in the French Embassy in London, um, also to Brussels, the European Union, uh, having served as Chief of Staff, uh, not to one, but to three successive Ministers uh, of Foreign Affairs, uh, in which role uh, he was immortalised uh, in the Bon Dessiné and then the delightful Tavernier film, uh, The French Minister. And if you haven't seen this, you should go see it and see whether you can figure out which uh, figure uh, is representing uh, Pierre Vimont. I know that he is slightly uncomfortable with this representation for the reason that his alias, his, uh, his avatar in the film, actually is shown sleeping. Uh, which is not something that Ambassador Vimont is famous for doing uh, in uh, office. After a, after a career which uh, took him to the very heights of diplomacy in Paris itself, um, he became French ambassador uh, to Washington, where he was probably the most popular French ambassador uh, since World War II. Uh, and in that role, uh, we had the very good fortune of uh, benefiting from the breadth of his vision uh, because it was Ambassador Vimont who was instrumental uh, in instigating and signing into effect uh, the Alliance programme that links uh, uh, Colombia to three of the great universities, not just in France but in Europe, uh, the Sciences Po, the Institut Polytechnique and uh, Paris Art Sorbonne. And having reached the heights of French diplomacy, uh, which was marked by the distinction, one of these uh, deceptively modest titles with which the French Republic uh, marks out its most distinguished service, namely Ambassador of France, not to a particular place, but just Ambassador to, of France to Cour. He moved on from there to become the founding figure of European diplomacy in its new form. He became uh, the leading uh, diplomat civil servant in uh, Europe's external action service from 2011 onwards, uh, serving as number two to Catherine Ashton, uh, and in that role was in the front line of the turmoil uh, with which the EU found itself confronted from 2011 uh, in the Arab Spring, which of course turned to the Arab a winter, um, and uh, in dealing with the crisis that preoccupies us this evening uh, in Ukraine from 2013 onwards, where, as Ambassador Vimont has written, um, Europe stumbled into a geostrategic imbroglio, the likes of which it has not confronted since the Cold War. So we have here a figure uh, of really central importance to the modern history of European diplomacy, and we are fortunate enough uh, and the riches of Columbia are such that we can put up in discussion with him uh, two heavyweight figures of our own. Uh, Terry Kamai, I'm very uh, proud to be able to uh, call uh, a colleague of mine in the history department, um, a, a product of Oxford uh, and Princeton, um, a leading expert on uh, Eastern Europe, uh, not just in the Cold War, uh, but in the all-important transition from the interwar period by way of the horrors of World War II into the Cold War period. The author, most recently, of The Paradox of Ukrainian Lviv, a borderland city between Nazis, Stalinists, and Nationalists, in which he accounts, if you like, for the making of the Ukrainian Western Ukraine, which is so central to the dilemmas of the Ukrainian crisis uh, in the present. 
And alongside him, uh, I have Alexander Cooley, a professor of political science at Barnard College and the current director of Columbia University's Harriman Institute, <coughs> whose research is particularly important for revealing the way in which the former Soviet states, particularly of Central Asia and uh, the Caucasus, have uh, made the transition into the post-Cold War period. He's the author of Great Games, Local Rules, The New Great Power Contest for Central Asia, and Ranking the World, Grading States as a Tool of Global Governance, Cambridge 2015, which he edited with Jack Snyder of Columbia University. Alex Cooley serves on several international advisory and policy committees. He's testified to the US Congress and the US China Economic and Security Review Commission and has briefed US and international officials on Euros and politics. So we have here a wonderful combination of diplomatic expertise, academic and historical uh, knowledge, uh, uh, which will allow us to open up, I hope, uh, this fascinating topic. Uh, I'll ask um, Ambassador Vimont to start us off uh, with a short uh, presentation on the Ukraine, and then I'll ask Tariq and Alexander in turn to respond. The only bad thing about this beautiful room are the acoustics. So forgive me throughout this session if I make periodic kind of checks with you, the audience, to see whether you can hear us talking. If at any time the acoustic breaks down so it becomes difficult for you to hear, please raise your hand, signal wildly, and we'll adjust the mics so that everyone can hear. But welcome, and uh, please uh, join me in welcoming our panel uh, for a very exciting evening of discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. And after those very kind introductory remarks, um, I will do my best to live up to expectation. Um, uh, and I will speak loud, uh, if I may so. Uh, because I'm always told that I have a very soft voice, um, which is done on purpose, because uh, the whole purpose of uh, speaking softly is that nobody will understand what I say, which is the best way for a diplomat to get away from the problems. Let me be rather brief in my introductory remarks because I think, first of all, it's good to hear uh, two other members of, of the panel and I don't want to take too much of your time. And I would like mostly to um, go on with three or four general remarks uh, that could open uh, the way for our debate. A first observation on the Ukrainian crisis seen from the European point of view is that it is a unique case, I think, in European history where the uh, European Union that has always considered itself as a soft power, therefore uh, an organization that is in charge of helping to solve the problems, uh, being a sort of honest broker, uh, a sort of a, a nice gentle organization that comes up with humanitarian assistance, financial contribution, etc has found itself for the first time in its history being uh, pictured as, um, as, as responsible for the crisis we're facing at the moment. In other words, Europe being part of the problem and not part of the, uh, of the solution. And of course, this is the narrative that, for instance, Russia has been putting forward since the beginning of this crisis in Ukraine, since uh, 2013, and, and so on and, and, and so forth. And of course, this has put Europe in a rather strange situation that they had never known before. The two reasons for this are the two actions Europe has been pushing in Eastern Europe since, um, since 2007 and, 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 and on. It's the Eastern Partnership, which was the idea of bringing our neighbors from Eastern Europe together and finding a way of working together with them and cooperating with them without going as far as launching a process for the accession and the membership of these countries um, uh, in, in, inside Europe. We picked up six of our members, one of them being Ukraine, the others being Georgia, Moldova, Belarus, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, and we tried to see how we could work together. Now, of course, putting all these six countries together uh, was immediately seen by Russia as um, a sort of plot against themselves because what's the point of having together in Eastern Partnership countries as controversial and sometimes as much fighting against each other as Armenia and Azerbaijan and for 
Russia, the only reason for that was that all those countries who are somewhat encircling Russia and appearing as potential candidates for strong partnership with Europe and therefore giving the impression that all this was a sort of conspiracy against the sphere of influence of, uh, of Russia. And of course, the second instrument in such a conspiracy was the, what was called and still called association agreement. Namely, agreements whereby uh, Europe sets up uh, arrangements with each one of these countries, trade arrangements, um, support for cooperation, technical cooperation, political dialogue, so on and so forth. And here again, with, with regard to those agreements, Russia had the clear impression that here again, Europe was starting to organize some sort of a conspiracy against Russia that, among other things, would uh, undermine Russia's trade with Ukraine or with other of these countries. For these two reasons, you had this strong reaction from, from, uh, from Russia in, uh, in Crimea, first of all, and in, um, and in uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, Donbass and Lugansk, once again, with the European Union taken somewhat aback by this reaction that they hadn't to a large extent anticipated. And one of the reasons I think for that was that Europe hasn't seen itself and perceived itself as much uh, as a geopolitical actor as maybe it needed to do when it went into this minefield that Eastern Europe did represent at, at the time. And I think that is something we have to keep in mind as we go on trying to understand what has happened since then. Of course, and that's my second comment, Europe, taken aback by such reaction from Russia, didn't know very well how to go ahead with this because, once again, they were not in the kind of position they are usually in very uncomfortable position with three major challenges. First one, profound division among the member states themselves because as soon as the crisis is related to this big entity called Russia, you don't have the 28 member states seeing eye to eye with regard to their, uh, to their relation with Russia. You have a big split between what I would call the new member states, the one that have come out of the former uh, Soviet camp and Soviet side who have joined Europe in 2003 and so on and so forth. And on the other side you have the older members of the European Union who have a somewhat different view with regard to Russia and think that we can find a way of keeping on dialing, di having a dialogue with them. And this division has remained there since then with one major issue that we haven't been able so far really to solve which is how, after what has happened in Ukraine, can we restart or reset a sort of dialogue with Russia, or how do we deal with Russia in present circumstances? The second challenge was, of course, with Russia itself. And when the European Union thought that maybe they could find a way of uh, bridging the gap that existed with Russia, they found Russian authorities, starting with Putin, of course, with the whole of government, not wanting to accept um, Europe as a partner, an acceptable partner for a way of building some sort of relationship. Look at a few examples, very obvious one. When Europe thought that maybe they could try to see how we could uh, relaunch uh, peace process with Russia with regard to Ukraine. Russia very bluntly said, no way, I will go for the OSCE and they will be the honest blocker in this year. Monetary mission was set up with OSCE and every time the European Union said, could I jump in, could I help in any way, the answer was no. When we tried more in a more original way to see if we could relaunch a sort of political dialogue to try to go for de-escalation, it didn't work either. The only way to find a way through was for Germany and France to set up what they have called the Normandy format that gave birth to the Minsk agreement that you know all about. Europe was left on the side. And every time we ask the question to the French and the Germans, could by a way or another Europe be part of your group, we could send a high representative for foreign policy as we did uh, before with Javier Solana on some of these issues, 
so that one personality could represent the whole of the European Union there? The answer was no, because Europe uh, couldn't get into this group because Russia uh, didn't want Europe to be there for always the same reason. Europe is part of the problem, it cannot be part of the, of the uh, solution. And the third challenge was, of course, the United States also, because we had a lot of pressure from the United States to take a very firm stance against Russia, sanctions, uh, military posture, so on and so forth. And of course, this also profoundly divided the European Union members who wondered how far should they go. Faced with these three challenges, third observation, what did Europe do? It found, as always, it muddled through, as always with the Europeans, in trying to find a course of action that could, to some extent, uh, bring all the member states on, on board. It was done in two ways with Russia. It was uh, what we have called the two-way uh, two um, two diplomacy. One was rather strong firmness in terms of sanctions because we went along with our American partners in setting up a full, uh, a full uh, <coughs> set of, of, uh, of sanctions, individual sanctions, economic sanctions, that I must say surprised everyone, even the Europeans, in managing to stick together and to go along with this. I've rarely seen in, uh, in the European history uh, debates and discussion and meetings where the 28 member states entered a room in total division and with strong differences of view and each time managed to get out with a common agreement on sanctions. Why? Because they discovered that unity was at the end of the day their only real strong asset uh, in front of, of Russia and they managed to go along so far with that. But at the same time, because it's Europe and we have to count balance or balance our act, there was also this idea that we were ready to go ahead and try to find a way of setting up a dialogue with Russia. How far did we manage? Not much, but a little bit here and there. We set up trilateral discussion with Ukraine and Russia on the gas and energy issue and the um, trade negotiations also. And we even managed, in order to appease some of the, uh, of the uh, Russian anger against, uh, against Europe, we, uh, we managed to postpone for one year the implementation of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. That was the main reason why Russia was so angry against Europe. We kept it on the side for one more year in order to try to see if we could find an agreement with Russia and try to find and build a compromise between Russia and Ukraine. To put it in simple terms, it didn't work. And at the beginning of this year, the DCFTA, as we call it, entered into action and Russia immediately took sanctions against Ukraine in the trade, in the trade sector. The second channel of action that we took was with regard to, um, uh, to Ukraine. It was very simple. We had not much room for maneuver, as I said, with regard to policy or diplomacy that was left to uh, Germany and France. We didn't have much room in the security and defense sector because this was left to NATO. NATO was much better equipped to try to find answers, and they found some answers in terms of reassurance and improved uh, uh, military posture with regard to Russia. So it was mostly left to Europe to work and build strong cooperation with Europe in the economic reform sector. And this is where we have been playing our part so far, trying to help with financial assistance, with uh, technical support, with uh, a strong team of, uh, and a strong task force that is working today on all the different issues um, that uh, Ukraine is facing. What are the core issues today? And here I would like to go very quickly underlining three main issues that Europe is facing today. The first one, relating precisely to Ukraine, is can there be a success with regard to economic reform and modernization of the Ukrainian economy? You know, there is a lot of... Um, parallel being done between uh, the Polish success, how they managed to modernize their economy in very few years, 
and managed to become a, a member of the European Union and Ukraine that since the Orange Revolution has been somewhat backtracking and uh, uh, being left uh, behind. I think, uh, I think we have to be aware that the situation is totally different. Uh, Poland, as many of the Eastern European countries, only came, became a part of the uh, whole system of the, um, of the, Soviet, um, the Soviet allies uh, after 1945, after the Second World War, uh, whereas uh, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union for much longer and gone through the uh, Stalinist period. And this has left uh, a lot of um, legacy uh, on their economy. And I think we have to be aware of that. People will say that then what has happened with Georgia has been a success, and maybe you could do the same with uh, Ukraine. In other words, a, a sharp shock therapy, the one that Saskatchewan has done in, uh, in, uh, in Georgia, and surprise, surprise, former President Saskatchewan is now in Odessa trying to do the same. But one can see immediately that he's facing major hurdles and major challenges at the moment and being a, a rather controversial figure, even with some of the current leaders of the um, coalition in, in Kiev. And one can see that therefore what is maybe needed with Ukraine is a much more complex um, uh, process of reform uh, on which nobody can tell today whether we will manage to get a success or not. There are those who say no way will we manage to get Georgia out of its eternal turmoils and its permanent turmoil in terms of economy, corruption, lack of an efficient rule of law, judicial system, state-owned enterprises and the oligarch system, and therefore it's uh, worthless and, and useless to try to, um, uh, to make a, a real difference with the current situation. And that those who are saying we should remain optimistic and just show enough determination on this. But that's, I would say, the first issue we're facing. The second one is the issue of Russia, of course. Can we find a common ground with Russia and try to find a way of getting out of the present confrontation between two spheres of influence? The, um, the way Europe would like to build its sphere of influence in its neighborhood and the way Russia is pushing back against that. Of course, in the current situation, this will not be easy and we have to be aware of that. Russia is rather self-assertive after what has happened in Crimea and in uh, eastern Ukraine. And the present uh, diplomacy of uh, Russia in the Middle East, in Syria and elsewhere, shows even more self-assertiveness with regard to that. So how can we build and rebuild something with Russia that would look like a, a new European order, either in the field of economy or in the field of security, still remains to be seen whether we can succeed there or not. And of course the third challenge and the third issue is with our American partner. We don't have exactly the same interests with regard to Ukraine, because we are a regional power. And, um, the U.S. has much more a global view about, about Ukraine. And in fact, for the Americans behind Ukraine, it's their relationship with Russia. For us, it's more complicated. And of course, our economic interests are very much different from the American one. If you only look at trade, we have 10 times trade and exports to uh, Russia than what Americans have at the moment. And this puts us in a totally different situation and that gives once again, a better understanding and a better understanding of the efforts the Europeans have made when they have set up sanctions. So, we have to understand that also with the prospect of a new American president coming into the picture in the years ahead, the um, diverging interest with regard to Ukraine and to Russia may appear maybe more acute and um, more difficult to solve than this has been up to now. Last comment, and I will stop there, and I apologize for being too long. I think at the moment, and if you look at the short term, Europe is going to be facing some three important short-term challenges in, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead. The first one is, uh, of course, the issue of the sanction. There is a deadline by the middle of this year, in June, 
where the Europeans will have to decide whether they renew the sanction or whether they don't. There is a real problem there because we can only renew sanctions now in Europe if we are all unanimous. If we, uh, it's not an op automatic renewal. It has to be adopted by the 28 member states. And the last renewal that we have made in December showed already some grudges here and there among some of the member states wondering whether we should go on with sanctions that were undermining our own growth and our own internal growth inside Western Europe and whether we should try to slowly get out of that uh, present straight jacket. And I think that as we go on with the need to renew every six months our sanctions, this decision is going to become more and more difficult. Think about Spain, think about Italy, that has been the one Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, has very, been very vocal last December for many different reasons, but one of them was that he felt, and he has been feeling that for some time, that those Russian sanctions were now somewhat um, going too far. The second challenge, of course, will be uh, the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. And we're seeing that despite a lot of efforts, even if there has been some de-escalation, many of the provisions of that Minsk Agreement, the whole issue about border control, the whole issue about <coughs> the decentralization of the Eastern Ukraine, is still very difficult. I won't go into that, you know, as well as I do, how difficult this could be in, in the months ahead. And the third challenge, I alluded to that a few minutes ago, is uh, the economic uncertainty of Ukraine. There has been a lot of uh, efforts being made to fight corruption, but recently, as you have seen, Minister for Economy has decided to get out of the government because he felt that he was prevented from going ahead in his anti-corruption uh, corruption, uh, policy. So these are the challenges we are facing. I think personally that Europe should stick to the course it has set so far. This, uh, with regard to Russia, this combination of firmness and uh, openness for dialogue, with regard to Ukraine's strong support for their economic uh, recovery. But I think maybe what's missing at the moment with Europe, and this is something where we need maybe to make more effort, is that if the current course is right, we find sometimes that we miss a plan in what Europe is doing. In other words, as I was saying at the moment, the fact that we have never acted as a geopolitical, geopolitical actor uh, makes it obvious that we need a sort of geopolitical vision, a sort of strategic vision about the way we want to behave in the months and years ahead with regard to Ukraine and with regard to Russia. And this is where I think, personally, we may need to do much more in the months uh, ahead. I've been quite too long, but I Thank you very much. I, I would like to pick up on, on something where, where, which has just been mentioned, uh, namely um, when I was trying to think about how to introduce um, the questions I would like to talk about uh, in conjunction with our topic and Ukraine tonight, I couldn't quite find my way, you know, I, I wondered whether one should talk in detail about the DCFTA, the, the trade agreement, the association agreement again, um, or about the party landscape in Ukraine. Um, and, and then, of course, there was the resignation of the Minister for Economic Development and Trade, which is, you know, this, this full portfolio, Ivaras Abromavicius, or Abromavicius, as, as he's usually spelled and, and called in Ukraine. And uh, I, I do feel that this resignation, which you may have heard about, um, and which has taken place really with a bang, um, is um, very emblematic. It's actually an extremely interesting um, vantage point from which to uh, take a closer look at some of the deeper problems Ukraine is now having after a second Maidan revolution, but also um, 
some of the deeper problems Ukraine has really had since independence because they really come together in this case. So um, I, th I think one thing one should say is that when, when you look at the resignation of Abramovichus, um, it's in, in one sense it's surprising and its timing is surprising. Um, so you keep, uh, <clears throat> the Ukrainian economy actually shows some signs of stabilization at least. Uh, you know, you get different estimates and you get different accounting, but it seems that the gross domestic product um, was shrinking last year by about 12 percent at least, and we have a forecast that it's actually going to mildly, very mildly increase by 1 percent in this year, 2016. Um, it seemed as if questions that have to do with the budget passing Parliament, which then is directly linked to um, actually maintaining the financing from the International Monetary Fund that Ukraine obviously very, very urgently needs. It seemed that these questions, at least for the time being, had been answered as good as can be. Um, so when you look at the way that, that the Minister of the Economy goes, it really is quite surprising that he does so at this particular moment. But then, if you take a slightly different perspective, um, it is really not a surprise at all it looks almost as if it had to happen sooner or later. Um, and mm, to show you why that's the case, I would like to quote a little bit, even at, at some length, uh, I hope you forgive me, from um, the statements that uh, the Minister of the Economy himself made when he explained his sudden resignation. Um, he uh, complained that he has seen or was seeing a sharp, it's a quote, a sharp increase in the blocking of all and any systemic and important reforms. Um, he insisted that this is not merely about the lack of support or political will. This is about active operations to paralyze our reform work uh, from the unexpected removal of the ministers of the ministers and his family's guard. Very very curious indeed, if you think about it as a step to the imposition of undergoing pressure of dubious persons to join my team and take key positions in state enterprises. Uh, my team and I don't wish to be a screen for open corruption or to be puppets to those who want to establish control over state funds in the manner of the old powers, clearly referring to what was going on under Yanukovych and of course also before Yanukovych. Um, I do not want to go to Davos, that basically means to the West, if you want, in a sense to us, and tell them about our successes, while issues are resolved behind our backs and in the interests of certain people. Now, um, this is obviously an extremely strong statement. Um, uh, to contextualize this, he has been supported in more or less explicit manners by the ambassadors of several very important Western nations, including with Britain, um, France, including the uh, representative of the European Union in, in Ukraine at this point, uh, also by the uh, ambassador of the United States, also of course by the International Monetary Fund. Poroshenko, Petro Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, has essentially said that um, he's still on the side of his minister of the economy and he would like him to reconsider. At the same time, um, there is now a national role for the investigation of corruption and it has actually started a preliminary investigation under a particular um, code of the criminal law of Ukraine which has to do with abuse of power. The questionings concerning that have actually started today but they are also supposed to last for quite a while until there is any sort of result. Um, now, um, so this is not a minor issue. This is not a fluke. This is not somebody getting very angry. It's certainly not somebody, and this is unusual for Ukraine after independence, it's not somebody who's really after party politics and personal enrichment. What's so interesting about this minister is that he is a really um, prime representative of this new guard of technocrats who were supposed to come in quite literally from outside, also from abroad. He himself is in a way both Lithuanian and, and also strongly rooted in Ukraine right now and to help Ukraine overcome its own legacies, as it were. Um, one could go into the, the details of with whom exactly he had a problem. Um, 
suffice it to say that it's a very close associate of the president, uh, Pedro Poroshenko, and that the associate until now has been, um, he has been questioned, but uh, I haven't seen any clear signs uh, of him being put out in the cold or of the president actually clearly distancing himself from him. Um, now, what's important about this is that there are really two aspects to what uh, Abramovichus was saying. One is the lack of reform, and the other one, of course, directly related to that, the issue of corruption, right? And the immediate, um, as it were, occasion, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, is actually corruption. The attempt to very directly impose a new deputy on him and into his team, um, which he sees, and I guess plausibly, as an attempt to once again um, achieve control over state enterprises. It's not to be forgotten that a lot of enterprises in Ukraine are still under the control of ministries. They still belong to the state. They haven't, in many cases, even been transferred to the state property fund, which would be the first step towards privatization. Privatization law in itself is a very problematic issue right now. It's often touted as a great achievement. In fact, it's not working very well. There's a long interview with um, the head, Vilus, of the State Property Fund, recently in Ukraine's Skoplavda, it's about 11, 13 pages, it's I think only in Ukrainian, unfortunately. It's very open, it's extremely interesting, it was so open that we tried to actually backtrack, but we still printed the whole thing. It's fascinating and it's quite, quite disturbing, actually. Now, um, the, the broader context, once again, about this resignation, the problem isn't only now, and it's not only him at all. Uh, if you think about the, the fact that this is an old problem that has been going on for a long term, Yanukovych, the last president, who was, of course, as you know, chased away, and whose regime fell, was egregious in terms of corruption, but he didn't invent anything new in Ukraine. Absolutely not. There was nothing principally new about what the Yanukovych family, the Sokol family, the clan were doing. There were exceptionally wild, savage, ferocious, and greedy about it, but corruption, unfortunately, has been pervasive in Ukraine at the latest since independence, and it certainly has increased since 2000, because that's when Ukraine came out of a massive post-Soviet depression. Um, now, when you look at Transparency International Index ratings, for example, Ukraine's position, Ukraine's score, which is more important than the position actually, has not changed between 2012, which is long before the latest revolution, and 2015. It has always hovered between 25 and 27. And the head of Transparency International in Ukraine, a man called Andrei Marusev, has recently been on. Romatsky TV, which is of course a TV station in Ukraine, which is very, very far from any suspicions of being pro-Russian or pro-old regime. It's actually a very revolutionary setup, if you want. He has been on Romatsky, and um, he has stressed how terrible this is, and that it really is a national board of shame, and that in his view, there is no difference in the status of corruption. You all know probably that the index reflects um, perceptions, but that's what we have. That's the background, of course, to Joe Biden telling the Rada in December 2015 that you basically have to destroy the cancer of corruption now or something terrible is going to happen to you. We had a very open intervention by um, Jeffrey Pyatt, the American ambassador, in October 2015, which nobody noticed, which was about the public prosecutor's office. That's a hint towards the way that the judiciary is not making great progress, and to put it mildly. There is a whole cohort of people, Sarkashvili has already been mentioned, um, who have come in from outside. Yarezko, Sarkashvili, Vigovarsky is a bit different, but he's also one of those people, Minister of Infrastructure, who has been trying to, to, to reform, actually do reform and not just talk about it. Um, Pirovarsky has already resigned several months ago. One of the first people to resign, it's already forgotten, was Pavel Sheremeta, that was also over the lack of reform. Um, Pirovarsky has now said in an interview with a German newspaper that he thinks that Abramovich's um, action was a last cry for help, a unique occasion for our government to cease its petty gains and return, return to a course of reform. That's, his perception obviously is already very, very critical. 
Um, and, and his interview ends with the remark that if the old system undermines all reforms, the old system, he means by now the current government, right? It's something to actually take note of. If the old system undermines all reforms, we, and he means the cohort <coughs> of, of technocrats, advisors, and so on, of reformers, will all leave together. And in fact, Natalia uh, Yarescu, who is of course seen as one of the other great iconic figures of this Western technocratic aid to Ukraine, has in fact also commented that um, she would be the next one if things do not change. Um, so the situation in terms of the implementation of reform, uh, especially when it comes to really the enormously important issue of corruption, the situation in terms of the implementation of reforms in privatization um, and generally in restructuring the economy right now seems to be at a very critical point. When I, I think one can quite objectively say that. One could be very pessimistic and, and predict gloom. That would be easy based on what we've seen over the last week. Um, but at the very minimum, I think, one has to acknowledge is that this is a crisis in, in the true sense of the word. It's either going to get much, much, much better, or it's going to get much worse, but it's not stable. It cannot stay the way it is now. And that, of course, backfires directly into the politics, the high politics, classical politics of Ukraine. We have talk of early elections. If early elections really take place, that could make implementing the Minsk Accord from the Ukrainian side even harder than it has been proven up until now, because you need constitutional reform. Constitutional reform requires three thirds of the Rada. That's a very, very dangerous stumbling block. Um, there is, of course, there has been talk about a, a possible political coalition between Saakashvili and, and Abramovichus. Abramovichus has already rejected that idea, which I can understand very, very well. Um, it is certain the, the position of the Prime Minister is extremely shaky, Yatsenyuk. Um, and we get very clear polling data out of Ukraine that shows that on most major issues, the population is already extremely dissatisfied, um, including, including the fight against corruption. Um, and, and, and that is, in part, directly laid at the door of the president, of Poroshenko himself, who stands as a, as a symbol also of this government. Um, so I wouldn't like to take, too much, uh, to take up too much time, and I hope we can also talk about these things in, in the Q&A, maybe. But my, my very preliminary conclusion, it's not even a conclusion, would be that um, it's certainly extremely volatile and, and as Ambassador Bimo has already said, it's extremely difficult to predict success or failure. I think one thing it certainly will not be. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to be fast. First, thank you, Dad, and thanks a lot to the Peter Institute for organizing this, this marvelous event. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here with you. Uh, that's what we want to hear your uh, perspective of, of, of the EU and, and, and an inside perspective on what happened. Um, you know, it's, it's an enormous challenge uh, being at the Aaron Institute in times like this because I think we have a, an obligation to to try and inform and educate, to air out different points of view, and, and of course, passions are very high about what has happened and continuing to do so. And so, having events uh, like this that you know our members of our community can uh, can be exposed to this very important European perspective is really critical, and we really we really appreciate um, this opportunity. Um, it's also been instructive me to try and figure out what the heck is Ukraine about. It's not actually an easy question. On one level it is, um, but then you start digging a little deeper and you start realizing the parties to this conflict are actually oftentimes not just talking past each other, they're talking at very different levels. And I think that's really one of the basic preliminary conclusions that I would sort of draw out. That here in the West, and in the States, mostly in Europe, this is a very clear uh, uh, situation, right? Which is the violation of one country's sovereignty by another. It's all international norms, the post-European uh, security order, clear-cut, right? Annexation, 
um, of Crimea, a sham referendum, then support for insurgents in the Donbass, special forces, material support, the whole thing. It doesn't get more clear cut than that. On top of the fact that the party doing it has violated numerous treaty obligations that were supposed to guarantee Ukrainian sovereign integrity, right? The, everyone heard of the Budapest Memorandum, 1994. Also, the Black Sea Fleet Accords that supposedly once and for all uh, partitioned the fleet, uh, portioned out Sevastopol on the leasing arrangement, but acknowledged Ukrainian sovereignty over it and so forth, all out the window. So when, 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 when proponents of, uh, well, lack of a better word, say, so the Ukrainian side look at this, and, and, and Ukraine's backers, it's, it, it, it seems like you can't get a more textbook example. I would submit that, though, that there's two other levels going on um, that complicate even speaking about uh, what's going on. And, and, and if one is this Russian-Ukrainian level, then there's one below a local level and one above an international level, right? So what's the local level? Local level is, um, of course, the often referred to historical uh, um, split amongst different uh, communities and, uh, and so forth, although these boundaries have been far more fluid, I think, than the press lets out to be, and, and I would recommend Tariq's you know, magnificent book on, 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 on changes in, in, in identities and compositions and, and affiliations. Um, but after the Maidan itself, I think there's some interesting developments in terms <coughs> of um, not wanting to side with a European economic orientation if you're in the dump. Right? that your networks, that your chains of production that are historically linked to Russia. Um, concerns um, that were not adequately dealt with with uh, far right-wing elements um, in uh, the post-Maidan phase, especially the storming of buildings. Um, actually, uh, uh, even concerns about uh, the crackdown on the Berkut. Um, a lot of the secret police actually came from the Donbass. Right? And, and sort of at least Giuliano over the Hammond has written a really interesting uh, paper on this, um, as well as um, the Russian the anti-Russian language law that was introduced in the Ukrainian uh, parliament. So, do all of these amount to sort of secessionist, legitimate secessionist concerns? Probably not in terms of you know the overall polling on these, but there are actually short-term types of issues that that, that mobilize some. Um, although the, the Nova Russia uh, plan was was a bridge too far and in tatters. So you have this local level. And so, um, on the one hand. On the other hand, you have this international level, right, where Russia, and especially the Kremlin, and here I would really recommend that everyone read Putin's Prime Minister's speech. Actually teach it in classes of mine. Um, not for its coherence, um, but because of all the imagery that it get, draws together, right? So what is this? This is about the crisis in the ecology of different borders, right? That the West institutions, right? the trade agreements, NATO expansion, NGOs that act like such special forces in places like Warsaw and Vilnius, that all of these institutions of Western liberal order have encroached upon the post-Soviet space one too many times, and the metaphor that he uses, we're a rubber band and we snap back. We're not going to take it anymore. Right? So, uh, Ambassador is absolutely correct that you know, Europe stumbles into this kind of geopoliticization of these tools and instruments that are considered to be geopolitical. And the polling data, and some by Lavab, the center, sort of bears this out. Um, Russian attitudes towards America have been actually very fickle, up and down, up and down. Positive views of the EU, until the crisis, were always steady, right? And always up there in terms of approval ratings, 60, 70 percent, and now Russian perceptions of Europe are at almost the levels of the U.S. Right? So, so something's changed. Right? A sort of a sense that this geopoliticization that the EU brought, or some of these uh, uh, instruments of influence, are part of this morass of sort of Western order encroaching uh, uh, into the Russian sphere. So, one of the ironies here is that. Uh, you know, in some ways, the Russian position on Ukraine is to talk about everything but Ukraine, right? That this isn't just about what happened in the Maidan or in Crimea. It's about this long litany of grievances, complaints, not being taken seriously, uh, not being part of making the rules is, you know, the, the, the type of argument they hear a lot. Now, what are some of the implications of this? First, one of the implications is that 
um, especially here in the West, when we talk about the conflict, um, the sides are very tribal in terms of the level of analysis. Right? To refer to the Ukrainian conflict as a civil war, or even as a local grievance, is an intensely politicized speech act. And you see commentators really savaging each other right, on, on this particular point. Right? Um, that no, it has to be one or the other, as if the world doesn't have different dimensions and different complexities. So that's one. Um, two, I think uh, how you view the conflict, right, and on what level also has implications for how we supposedly can get out of it, right? Um, which is not easy because the policy response in Brussels and certainly in DC has been um, really set up for that second level, right? So let me just turn to now a few kind of observations on how this has been managed by the West. Ambassador's absolutely right. U.S. strategy has been to let Europe take the lead. Take the lead. Impose <laughs> sanctions. Really, be resolute. Because he's absolutely right. They don't affect us. Not nearly to the same degree, right? So this has been definitely a part of this. At the same time, the Obama administration has drawn deep criticism um, from some political quarters, and David Kramer the McCain Institute so has this line when he gives public speeches, that uh, the U.S. has sacrificed its principles in the name of transatlantic unity. Right? That by allowing, by, by deferring to Europe, the U.S. hasn't been resolute in what it's wanted to do. You've also seen a lot of commentary uh, about criticizing the president about the weakness of his response, right? juxtaposing him with a more aggressive and decisive Putin. Right? So Putin doesn't have to wait around. He makes quick, decisive decisions, and the Obama administration is always having interagency meetings. And tepid, Dan X and I have a piece in Foreign Affairs that tries to sort of blow that up from the geopolitical imperatives that the two sides face. You know, the U.S. faces a multitude of contradictions in its alliance networks where it has to work these out, whereas Putin really can just go into Syria or just go into Ukraine or whatever. Let's leave that aside. I think perhaps almost significantly, um, and, and I think this is a fair criticism. Um, the Obama administration has maintained the idea that this, from the beginning, was a regional conflict. So it's not a global conflict. The relationship with Russia is possibly a global issue. Um, but for the longest time, they wanted uh, uh, to box this in and say this was not going to have global re implications, it's going to have regional implications. Um, and in some ways, they did. What they were forced to do in terms of reaffirm commitment to NATO partners, reintroduce more rotational forces, um, reassure the Baltic states, Poland, and so forth. Um, but the president even had, I think, you know, one of the line that you know, Russia's a regional power. It's kind of a dismissive thing. It just drove Putin nuts. Uh, and one can make an argument. One of the big motivators of Syria, not the sole motivator, is for Russia to reassert itself as a global player. Right, on the world stage, to be involved in decision-making issues of peace and security at the highest level. How do you like the regional power now? Right. Final observation is that there has been, I, I would say, a little too much smugness about the impact of sanctions here. The sanctions have coincided with declining oil price. Right? It's very difficult to disentangle the effects of it. But in part because sanctions were successful against Iran, especially this brand of sort of smart sanctions targeting individuals, targeting uh, 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 sectors, uh, freezing the point of financial transactions. If the Treasury has sense the power to go. Oh, I think there's, there's, there's a sense that the sanctions are working, the Russian economy is being damaged. Why take the foot off the pedal now? Um, but I think we're, we're lumping a lot of things together. So then just finally some brief comments on where we go from here and why I actually I agree gloomily um, that there are a lot of challenges here. First of all, there's been a lot of talk about, well, can't there be a grand bargain? Can't we just go to level three, right? And throw everything together, Syria and the peace process and Ukraine and world order and NATO and we'll have one big grand geopolitical bargain about everything. That actually completely plays into Russian hands. It completely plays into level three, and it's not clear to me what the exact configurations of that would be or whether it would be stable or not. I'm not saying that these issues don't need to be worked out. They clearly do. But the minute you start cross-pollinating an issue like Syria with an issue like Ukraine, 
what I would argue also an issue like engagement uh, with the Eurasian Economic Union, as some have tried to do. Um, I think you are counteracting a lot of the logic of the policy instruments, especially on sanctions, which are specific attempts to punish uh, a country for infractions on Crimea or um, uh, to elicit compliance with Minsk II and so forth. And, and, and I think that the grand bargain itself would be messy and I think would create a lot of problems that it seeks to solve. Um, again, it's all my personal view. I think trends in Minsk II, for Minsk II themselves, I was a little more optimistic a couple of months ago. I'm a little more pessimistic now. Uh, in part because I think, uh, you know, we're not seeing progress on the decentralization front. And when we say decentralization, this isn't just about giving authorities more, you know, local autonomy. Um, you know, the Russian view of decentralization is that there should be veto power over foreign policy directions, right? It's, it's not just a local politics issue. It's that the special status should confer to the Donbass the ability <coughs> to reject fundamental foreign policy decisions by Kiev. Deeply problematic. The other thing I think that Minsk II underestimated was just the process of state building in Ukraine itself. Sort of our late colleague Charles Tilly wrote the famous words, war makes the state and the states make war. You see that in Ukraine, right? President Poroshenko, when he was here, pointed this out in September that before the war, 17, 18% of respondents said that they would fight in the Ukrainian army. This, Proportions up to sort of 60, 70 now. So you have Ukrainian statehood, nationhood, active civil society that is monitoring these failed attempts at reform. Um, and that is not a political climate that's conducive to the necessary kind of two thirds majorities, um, especially in a context where there's a perception that Russia is weakening, the sanctions are working. Um, why do we want to do this now? Time is on our side. Um, so let me, let, me, let, me, let me end with one, one, one final kind of uh, uh, observation about just how we got here geopolitically and, and then where we go now. I think part of what we're seeing is um, the real clash between kind of our transatlantic instruments, right? NATO expansion, this open door policy. Everyone can get into NATO if you apply these criteria. No, uh, everyone can partner. Um, with the West if they adhere to these principles. That's bumping up against this notion of a Russian sphere of influence. And we have three states now that are divided, not just by local disputes and ethnic conflicts, but these are geopolitical spheres of influence too. Georgia, Moldova, and I don't have time to get into what's happened to Georgia as a response in, in, in time. Georgia, Moldova, and now Ukraine, right? Um, and, and, and in some ways, this challenges us to think about, well, is it really possible right, to maintain uh, this open door transatlanticism on the one hand, and then second hand, on, and then at the same time, um, lobby for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of these same states. Seems to me that's pretty hard to do, that if there is a way forward, there has to be an attempt to reconcile these different architectures of order. Right, within the same space. I don't know how that's done, whether it's symbolic, committee upon committee, right, or different <laughs> working groups, or, or, or so forth, but we have really reached the limit of this 1990s, early 2000s period of sort of unfettered, unchecked expansion. I'll leave it at that. Uh, well, um, I uh, promised you a rich panel, and uh, have we delivered this evening? Um, I think so much so that at this point it would be really useful to try and uh, get the panelists up here to, to respond to each other. And perhaps the, the challenge of Alexander's magnificent prospectus at the end can bring some of the insights from the European side, and then um, Tariq's wonderful kind of microcosmic intervention into some kind of dialogue with each other. And I wonder whether. I might just ask Ambassador Vimon and, and, and Tariq to, to respond, perhaps, along, along um, well, there's very, uh, you should feel free to choose. I saw you both sort of notes as Alexander was talking. But I mean, one thing that I think might be helpful for the audience to do is to revisit 2013. Um, um, and this may be my historian's prejudice, but 
But given what Tariq was telling us about the long durée of issues of governance and state building in Ukraine, what exactly was going on within the European decision-making process that allowed us to move into association agreement type talks, especially when the political economist in my head is saying, this is the wake of the Eurozone crisis, no one in Europe is willing to be generous at this point. The deal that is going to be offered offers Kiev a train wreck uh, in the fall of 2013. Um, how w was this, uh, given the evident problems on the state construction side that Terry you know, highlighted so wonderfully in this case, where were the connections not being drawn on the European side? And perhaps to Tariq, a question about about how you see from the inside of the Ukraine, if you like, the responses to what happens next, so the Minsk process, and how Europe figures in the attempted stabilization of a new regime in Ukraine from 2014 onwards, um, how that, that plays out. Because as Ambassador Dimon was making clear, this is a force field, and it extends not just the sanctions after all, but certainly in the German press, the hot button issue is the, and there one has to disaggregate Washington, right? The, the real worry in Berlin is that we're replaying Iraq, that there is a war faction in Washington that is pushing beyond sanctions towards various types of military engagement, and Obama is holding the line by means of delegating to Merkel because the real worry is that Breedlove and his folks in NATO are pushing for a much more aggressive kind of stance. So I would be really fascinated to hear how that looks from the point of view of Kiev. But just that you two could, could as it were, triangulate the, uh, with, with what Alexander said. Maybe perhaps Ambassador Dimon, you would, you would, you would uh, respond in some way. This time I can try. Um, trying to remember how it uh, happened in 2013, it's quite striking that now what there we are witnessing one of the perfect examples of um, EU being driven by processes. In, in other words, we had launched a negotiation for an association agreement and we were going ahead because we thought it was right, uh, we thought everybody should be happy with it, and could I add, uh, because this is uh, what has been told to me time and again, at every meeting with either Putin or Lavrov, they never complain. So why shouldn't we have gone ahead? And when someone was uh, underlining the fact that maybe they didn't complain, but you could look at their body language, and you could just read what was being said in the press or elsewhere, one could easily see that there was maybe a problem there. So I think it was about process driven uh, and a situation that came about. Was it deliberate on some of the um, European negotiators? Maybe, I don't know, history will tell. I would like to add another uh, additional point which I think is important is don't forget that for instance the summer of 2013 which I think was crucial from the point of view uh, Armenia deciding at the beginning of the summer that they won't go ahead anymore with the association agreement. Yanukovych being convened to Sochi nearly every weekend by Putin and one could sense that something was going on. The summer of 2013 is also the summer of the chemical weapons in Syria. And when foreign ministers meet around August to discuss, among other things, Ukraine, they're totally um, obsessed by Syria. and they personally don't give much attention to Ukraine. And uh, I think it's a pity, but that's the way things work quite often in reality. Um, and I think this also has, um, has um, played um, a, a, major, a major part. Uh, I think the last one, and coming back to that, you can only have a real understanding of the situation if precisely you have a sort of geopolitical understanding and geopolitical vision. And I think I come back to what I was saying at the beginning. If this is missing, then you're in for trouble, and quite often. And I think this was really what it was all about at the end of the day. We should have been much more careful right from the beginning as we were trying to move ahead, as NATO was doing also on its side, that at some point we were going to find the wall of the Russian resistance. 
because we were going somewhat too far. Uh, and once again, it's not being naive about Russia. I think, uh, as uh, it was very well said by Alex, the violation of convention, the violation of so many agreements was, is not acceptable. Uh, but we were moving into a ground uh, that we hadn't really understood uh, and uh, assess in the right way because we hadn't assessed the whole situation in Europe at the time as it was going on. And summer of 2013 was also the summer of Snowden and a really yes. dramatic alienation between Berlin and Washington that I think Russia very, very acutely sensed the significance of. Uh, to... uh, yeah, um, perhaps to, to come back to the question about what, what the European Union's role might be, might be in, the, in the future, in future developments. Um, I, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the deep and comprehensive free trade area and, and the association agreement are fully in force now. Um, they haven't been ratified yet, but I mean, the next, the next very interesting thing that is actually going to happen inside the European Union is the referendum in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, where I'm, I'm not quite sure, frankly, of, of its legal power. It seems that its outcome is not necessarily binding, but what we do see is that the polls now seem to indicate that there is a majority for saying no, and what happens next then is, is another question to the European Union. So the European Union, as such, um, maybe Ukrainians still have to fully realize this, but the European Union obviously is not united, and it's not one thing. Um, you could also ask, what is the European Union now? Is it um, Donald Tusk, who is you know, the face of liberal Poland, or is it the people who are actually in government in Poland and who won't hardly talk to Donald Tusk anymore, right? Is the European Union uh, Angela Merkel, who certainly has a lot of weight, or is it maybe Horst Seehofer, who does go to Moscow, which he has been obviously heavily condemned for, and I don't quite see why. Uh, is, it, is it Orban? What is the place of somebody like Orban in the European Union if the European Union is such a wonderful place of liberal values and so on and so on? So there's a lot of complications to come there, you know? The, the European Union that was an idea for the second Maidan revolution at the beginning that was actually called the Euro Maidan that changed later is not something that exists in reality. I mean, Yes, there is a European Union, and it shares certain features with this idea, but it's certainly not the same thing. Um, in terms of, in much more pragmatic terms, of course, there is the question of what the access to the markets of the European Union will do for the Ukrainian economy, and then there's a very good question of foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment from the Russian side is often overestimated. It's actually not that large in Ukraine. It's already larger for countries such as Germany or uh, the Netherlands, in fact. Um, foreign direct investment from the Russian side of Ukraine is at the level of the level of Austria, 6%. It's not actually that much. Um, the trade flows are already changing, but we can't tell why. Is it because of the war, or is it, is it something more lasting? It seems that trade is actually going more towards the European Union and less to the Russian Federation. What's more disturbing about this is you could have a very simplified picture in which every loss to the Russian Federation is automatically a gain to Ukraine. That's probably not true. That's probably not true. And especially when, if and when the territories that are now under the Luhansk and Donetsk uh, Republic pseudo regimes have to be fully reintegrated after Minsk perhaps working one day, um, that question won't go away either. Remittances from Russia, by the way, are still very important for the Ukrainian economy. So the, 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 the picture is very mixed. Europe is not in a position to simply replace Russia too core quickly in Ukraine. That's actually not happening. Um, certainly when you look at gas imports, reverse flow, it has been happening relatively fast. Um, the, 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 the proportions between Ukrainian gas that is coming from the Russian Federation or through the Russian Federation, Ukrainian gas that is coming from the European Union have been reversed over two to three years. That has actually happened. Now, I think the bigger question is a more fundamental question. It's my last point. Um, where does the European Union actually fit in Ukrainian perceptions with respect to NATO? I mean, one of the problems that the European Union has perhaps not addressed sufficiently is that it's actually not NATO. And it's not sort of NATO, and it's not a step towards NATO. Which, of course, is very difficult to perceive if you take into account that the same people who run the European Union also made a horrible mistake in 2008 and 
actually saying that Ukraine will be in NATO one day, and Georgia. That was just before the war, obviously. Right? The Ukrainian war took a little longer to actually unfold. Um, that was historically unprecedented. NATO has never done anything like that before, and it was obviously a big mistake. It was too little to deter anybody, clearly, and it was far too much for a stable situation. So one really wonders how these things happen. Um, Poroshenko, and this is important to understand, Poroshenko is a very difficult situation because he is telling his people things that are patently not true. First of all, he's still insisting that the association agreement is a first step towards European Union membership. That is not true, actually. It might be that one day in retrospective, it might very well not be, right? Secondly, he's still saying that Ukraine will get into NATO. Not now, he says, in a recent interview, but in the nearest future. And what makes all of this worse is that he's describing these perspectives, literally, these are his words, as the light at the end of the tunnel. But if that's the light at the end of your tunnel, that, that's really not good, because both of those are illusions. I'm very sorry. It's, it's really not in sync with reality. So the, 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 the way that, to me, the worst image of Western influence of Ukraine, the worst single image is the reckless behavior of Western politicians and also some intellectuals during the Second Maidan Revolution. Going to Ukraine as a sort of fairground of revolution, enjoying the atmosphere on the Maidan, giving huge speeches about our values, and simply not caring how difficult and dangerous this geopolitical fault line actually is, and was not that hard to see. So I think that both NATO and EU, ideally, um, need to become much, much clearer about what they can do and what they can't do. Uh, this should take different forms. Personally, I think in the case of NATO, it should take the form of making it very clear that Ukraine will not be a member. That would actually be, be better for Ukraine. I think most Ukrainians disagree with me on this, but that's what I think. In the case of the EU, it should be made very, very clear that the EU is actually not a stepping stone to NATO, and it's also not something that will provide decisive security against Russia. It does come to that. Thank you very much. So, we must at this point have questions, I imagine. So, <coughs> here, this gentleman here. Well, I'm going to bundle them in, in groups, uh, which gives the speakers up here a chance to, to structure their responses. So, gentlemen here. Has, has not. Has not the United States friction with Russia for the Ukraine propelled Russia into the opening, openly embracing arms of China? Of China? Mm. Great question on the implications of this for China and whether China is perhaps the great winner from this whole embargo. Gentlemen here. How how seriously uh, do you think the uh, leadership in the Kremlin takes? The ideas, uh, the policy uh, recommendations of Alexander Dugin. And then the lady at the front here. No one has. Yeah, really close. Yeah. No one has forced any of those uh, former Soviet republics into any economic partnership and I refer to the countries you mentioned before, Moldova, uh, Georgia, or Ukraine, and to say that this is an error is to imply that Putin's complaints, as you clearly expressed them, are in effect statements affirming Russia's right to determine the future of those republics. Why should we just put up our hands and say that Russia does have the right to claim that those countries cannot do what those countries want to do. Excellent. That will provide us, Chris, for a few responses and then we'll, we'll take another <laughs> round. Excellent. So who would like to take up some of these points? Yes, Professor Lee. Um, on the last question, um, Maybe I, I, um, I don't want to draw the confusion, but I don't think it was an error to, to go on negotiating an association agreement. I think the principle and the goal is a good one. It was about the way we did it uh, that, was, uh, that was wrong. In other words, uh, while moving ahead, we're trying to go on from the association agreement with each of these different countries. 
because they are not going to stay, I, I mean or another, in, in, um, in contact with Russian leadership in order to explain in a better way what was going on, to take on board maybe some of the consequences of those agreements for Russian economy, uh, because they are. Uh, and the fact that we have been so easily um, uh, disregarding some of the Russian concern when a few years ago, when we enlarged in Europe to Spain or Portugal, and that great country like the United States was com complaining that this would have some impact on their economy, we run to, uh, to, uh, to America to try to find a solution. We negotiated uh, with, uh, with America the, these consequences. So it would have been rather natural, in my opinion, to go to Russia and to say, listen, we're going to go ahead with this association agreement, but very early on to be able to tell them we're quite ready to look at the consequences of this and the impact on your economy and try to find a solution. I don't mean by that that we would have been successful, but at least we would have tried. Whereas, for instance, I think very much inspired by ideology, we just refuse to take into account some of this Russian concern. And I think this is really where the mistake was. And I'm not talking about the last months of, uh, you know, we started those association agreements around 2008, 2009. This was the time when we should have uh, started to have a uh, discussion with Russia about the consequences of those association agreements. And I think this is where something went wrong in the whole process. Question of China, perhaps. And then we have Russian yeah. nationalism in the background. Yeah, so. So this is interesting, right? This sort of attempt, especially in May 2014, to signal that, you know what, Wes, we don't need you, right? We are an independent great power in the multipolar world, and we're going to pivot east, right? It's very public demonstrative pivot over to Beijing, the conclusion of this mega gas deal and so forth. This is the Russia... This is the Russia-China... Russia, China, Russia, yeah, China. yeah, 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 that's right. And, you, and a lot of my um, you know, Russian counterparts are... You know, busy at conferences talking about pending geoeconomic shifts and alliances and so forth. So just some facts. U.S. Chinese trade per year is about $600 billion, right? Russian Chinese trade is back down to 70. They thought they would do 100 billion with the collapse in oil prices. It didn't happen. They're going to get nowhere near that figure anytime soon. But clearly there's this aspiration, right, to create this partnership for a multipolar world. In practice, though, what that means is that Russia increasingly defers to sort of Chinese geopolitical objectives in this interest of sort of anti-Western solidarity. China is very skilled at telling Russia what it wants to hear, right? Which means what? Beijing never publicly criticizes Moscow, almost ever, even on something like Crimea, right? Um, because there's nothing to be gained, because the Chinese understand that public deference, public respect to Russia is something that the Kremlin values, and to them it's costless, right? So China will just go ahead and do what it wants, cut very tough pieces with Moscow. Um, but this really is more, maybe more to it than an axis of convenience, because there's this normative dimension, there are the values issues and the rights issues and so forth, that they're aligned. Um, but the cooperation is on Beijing's term. And if Moscow thinks it's going to be cut deals, you know, in, in, res in response to this, not going to happen. Very final indicator, uh, Russian companies just haven't been able to roll over their debt um, going to China or to secure financing the way they thought they would. It just hasn't happened. Um, so in terms of China being a substitute for the West, um, you know, there's been a lot of posturing, but it, it's, 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 it's deeply problematic. Okay. And Russia and China have military exercises to be sure. What's the answer to the third question? What's the answer to the third question? Oh, do we have the Russian nationalism answer? Sure. Oh. Uh, do good. Um, how influential is Alexander do good? Uh, I don't think he's incredibly influential, um, but these different strands of what is neo-Eurasianism have definitely sort of proliferated amongst leading academics, policymakers, scholars. You know, if one looks at you know, someone like you know, Sasha Lukin, like you know, and the pieces he's written in 
and Ford of first based on a talk here, one of them, about you know, the moral decay of the West and how the Eurasian Union's fabric is going to be composed of um, you know, based in community and religion. There was a kind of a virulent anti LGBT agenda here going on too. Um, so part of it's there, but but, but frankly, um, you know, Dugan in, in, in some quarters has expressed even disappointments that Russia didn't go far enough, right? The number of Russia thing never happened, didn't actually confront the West. So I don't see him as directly influential, but I think there has been the spawning of, of what is the kind of normative fabric of this Russian-centric pole that they're trying to construct. What will that look like? And, and that's under under debate. So, gentlemen, at the back with the beard, and then next to him, and then I'm going to go across the back. Okay, so um, I wanted to ask you to address also the China question you yeah. just had. So I was reading not long ago that China was leasing parts of Ukraine. And also, Timothy Snyder touches on this in his new book, Black Earth. So we know Ukraine has this maybe part of a natural resource curse that's being seen up a breadbasket of Europe. How does Russia think about this new trade potential agreement with Ukraine and China. Gentleman next to you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I was wondering, these countries have constitutions that they don't enforce. Uh, is there any way that these would help? And is there any way that international pressure could get them to follow their own supreme laws? Do we have gentlemen back here? Just a series of like European politicians are visiting uh, Russia. Like last week, we had a de delegation from Austria headed by the vice chancellor, and we had you know officials from Bavaria. Uh, should we see these as like breaches of European solidarity, or rather as keeping dialogue open with Russia? Something basically see, see it as something negative or something positive? Maybe that's a great question for yeah. Ambassador Zemo. I think to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's a bridge of solidarity because I think more or less every country has been doing that with one exception is that the European Union itself is not more or less allowed by the other member states to go and have its own dialogue with Moscow. In other words, um, the 28 member states agree to say that we shouldn't have an open dialogue between uh, the European Union and Moscow, but they themselves think they can have uh, uh, for many reasons for their own interests. So, since the um, since the um, the Ukrainian incidents of accession of Crimea, uh, the conflict in Donbas, you have seen a steady flow of uh, of European leaders going to to Moscow. At the beginning, they did it in a sort of low profile way. Now uh, everybody is doing it, and it's um, and it is uh, going on. I think this contradiction is somewhat difficult to accept, and at some time it should be allowed for the. Uh, um, the high representative, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, to be able to go and to have an open, an open dialogue with uh, Sergei Lavrov in, in Moscow. At the moment, uh, member states don't want her to do that. So it's only at the level of officials that we have those visits at the moment. And to, in order for Mrs. Mogherini to see Lavrov, she has to go to New York in, in the margins of the UN General Assembly or things like that. So it's somewhat ridiculous, and I think we should put an end to this. But that's Situation. So we have the issue of the natural resource course and, yes. and uh, the sense of Ukraine of this sort of attractive bread basket of Europe. Yeah. And on the other hand, the issue of constitutionalism. Yeah, all what three candle constitutionalism. <laughs> let, let, let me just say something this Ukraine China thing. Um, it, it's actually fascinating, right? So China did sign quite a large loans for. Um, wheat meal during the Yanukovych regime, right? Um, basically pledging, I think, about three billion dollars worth of product over to China. Uh, that money's gone. Right? It's, it's, it's not there, and you know, just judging by how Beijing handles these kinds of commodity debts elsewhere, they're not going to put the squeeze on it to get it back. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, Beijing is very aware of you know, perceptions that Russia has about this neck of the woods, but what you'll see all of these deals and arrangements bundled under is this idea of this kind of new one belt, one route um, 
kind of outward expansion to go west. And this is where I think the greatest economic threat to this kind of Russian vision of hermetically sealing Eurasia comes is not from Europe, it actually comes from the East. Right? Because the two really are incompatible. For China, Eurasia is a transit corridor on its way to Europe, on its way to the Middle East, on its way to South Asia. Right? For Russia, it is a space that they want to guard and protect and have their own economic architectures over. Something's got to give. And publicly, they say they're going to have commissions that are going to work this out, and they'll apportion the projects and so forth. But even that, the game's up. If you're talking in terms of projects as a way to sort of, um, uh, you know, basically try and rein in these hundreds of Chinese companies that are cutting these deals. Um, so, uh, so no, I think China, in terms of transit, in terms of influence, you know, it extends all the way um, through the Caucasus, through Central Asia, and in the Western and I, and Belarus even. And I think uh, Russia might be concerned about it, but it's made its own bed in some ways now. It's going to be very difficult for it to publicly push back um, against Chinese encroachment. Constitutions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the constitutions of, of independent Ukraine actually have been a complicated issue for long, long term. You know, there was a major reform in the 90s. Um, there was um, a, a minor but very important reform and shift in. I do apologize for this. If you have any experience in this room, you'll know that, that is not as bad as it can get. Uh, we, we could have a full-on explosion of the sound system. Uh, but, but, uh, but hopefully, it'll stay like that. Try again. Yeah. So, um, there's, um, there was a shift and there was a reform after the Orange Revolution, the first Maidan Revolution. Yanukovych came in and unilaterally and, and clearly illegally then revoked that. Um, now that has been revoked. Um, the, the, one important thing for Ukraine, I think, is, is not so much... Um, yeah, there, there are very important questions involved in whether it's, um, it's a parliamentary or presidential republic, um, and where the weight of parliament and the president for. <laughs> But, but, but the other thing is that you, your question really was aiming, I think, at the rule of law and, and whether outsiders can support the rule of law in Ukraine, um, which would imply the reform and the reliability of the judiciary. Once again, of course, that you cannot um, escape the law or bend the law via either political or economic power or simply via bribery, all very, very common. Um, the, you know, I mean, who knows? The, the Ukraine has never been as dependent on the West as now. That, that's one very simple fact. Uh, the West also has never been as involved with Ukraine as now. And I, I think a lot of people in the West are still going to learn what that actually means. And it's not going to be what they thought in 2014. But nevertheless, that's where we are and it may in the end be good thing. So maybe there is a potential for actually increasing conditionality. You may, you may have actually seen this just now. I mean, the, the interventions that have come from the ambassadors of Western nations and from the representative of the European Union are really uncommonly forceful and public. Um, you also see very quiet things that are hardly reported, like, for example, the security advisor of, of German Chancellor Merkel has been in uh, Kiev like three weeks ago, more or less, sometime in January. Uh, nobody tells us what was being talked about. Actually, his French counterpart was also there. Um, but the, the guess is, the guess is that, that one thing they were doing was telling Poroshenko to really please see to it that he finally gets a majority to do the decentralization that they need for Minsk to work. So the, the West, you know, there is a chance in the fact that the fighting is scaling down. The West may now be in a position to actually be harder and more demanding with Kiev. And that might be very good for Ukraine, in fact. Um, the dependency on the West might have advantages. Gentlemen here, I'm going to go down this side, so maybe we can have the right gentleman here, gentleman there, and then lady at the back. Uh, Professor Cooley, does it make it difficult for the United States 
uh, to implement its national interest in security and relate to Russia on global issues. When it expanded, uh, you know, NATO's military expenditures by five times in the last week, which you know draws NATO closer to the western border of, of Russia, which really is very exciting to them. Okay, so gentlemen behind in the is it Clements? It is Clements, and then the woman at the back. Uh, Professor Omar, I, I think um, what you were talking about, about Poroshenko kind of still selling the idea of the association agreement as a step towards the EU or a step towards NATO is really interesting, especially because that was a really prominent component of the Maidan revolution also. Um, and I'm wondering how much of that is politics coming top down from the leadership and how much of that is them seizing on popular opinion um, and it's more of this popular myth that has a lot of political currency. Um, just any comment. Well, the mind travels back. It's worth saying that that was also Yanukovych's pitch, right? In desperation in 2013 or something pretty close to it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I would like to first appreciate your discussion of this because I am Crimean myself, so it's really fascinating to listen to you. Um, and I have two brief questions that are quite hypothetical. Uh, first, if Ukraine suddenly tried to invoke the United for Peace uh, resolution uh, to get the UN peacekeeping force um, to Ukraine, do you think it would have had any chance to uh, win uh, like the necessary uh, number of votes? And the second question is, uh, do you think if Ukraine suddenly sent troops to Crimea to regain it, or backed uh, Crimean Tatar movements, because uh, there is a certain tendency to uh, towards militarization of Crimean Tatars right now. So do you think uh, the West would have backed um, Ukraine in this action, or what would it, what would the reaction be like? Thank you. So we have NATO, yeah. we have the dynamics of over-promising, yeah. then we have the hypotheticals of the UN involvement, and on the other hand, Insurgency counter, yeah. sort, of, sort of as it were, playing Russia's own game back at itself with a kind of a messy uh, view of the war. Massimo Dumont, do you want to? We're going to go, I'm, I'm not going to leave Terry the last this time. <laughs> um, no, I can try the last question because it's an interesting one. On, on, on the UN, uh, would there be a, a majority in supporting? Um, um, a resolution united for peace. You know, when even before going to that extreme, when we uh, try to put and um, uh, through the European uh, side or the American side, when we try to convince our partners in the UN to move along and condemn Russia and what they did in the annexation of Crimea or the eastern Ukraine, we didn't get much support for the reasons given by Alex with uh, when he was mentioning China. The Chinese position was very much shared by most of our partners outside of uh, Western Europe, uh, what I would have called it the, the former 77 group of, of nations. Um, the, these countries didn't want to get involved. We went around Africa, we went in the Middle East and said, how can you uh, refuse to condemn uh, obvious violation of uh, international principles. And they all said, these are obvious violation of international principles, but we will keep this for ourselves. And, and so I don't see at the moment any real change in, 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 in the present attitude. Um, maybe there will be some change with some of the Middle East countries. I'm thinking maybe about Turkey or Saudi Arabia because of what's happening in Syria and because they're becoming more and more um, angry at, at Russian intervention. But otherwise, the large majority, I think, wants to stay out of, um, of a confrontation that they think is mostly about the Western world on one side and Russia on the other side. Um, and today, the trend among all these countries is non-West, I would say. It's not anti-West, it's non-West. We don't want to get involved in your problems. We want to stay out of this. Um, you, Ukraine trying to get back to Crimea, I think what they're doing at the moment is, uh, is to some extent much more interesting, which is, as you know, cuts in electricity, so on and so forth, which has, in fact, slowly created 
a strong uh, uneasiness among the Crimean population at the moment because Russia had promised a beautiful land to Crimea and the Crimean population is still discovering um, more than a year after the annexation that life is much more difficult than they would have thought and that may go on for a long time. And I think this is where Russia may find itself in trouble. I don't think that at the moment they are in trouble with the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. They're very happy that things are going on. The status quo puts them in a very comfortable position. And as on the other side, the Ukrainian government is not trying to be very helpful in implementing this thing. The only two countries that are really looking for a full-fledged implementation of, uh, of um, the Minsk Agreement are Germany and France, hence the visit that was made by the two advisors. But these are the two only countries that don't have much leverage on the ground. So um, this is where we are. So if personally uh, I think something would go on in Crimea, it would be much more in the kind of um, disruption of the uh, Crimea economy rather than uh, moving military into the into the country at the moment. So we want to take the issue of the European commerce that you um, <coughs> the European commerce. Um, which oh the overselling. Yes, the overselling. Um, yes, of course. Um, I don't know. Uh, frankly I don't know. I mean you can you can look at opinion polls and they show you that um, the EU has um, still a lot of popular appeal. It may be an idealized image, as I think it is, but you know, it's there. And um, Poroshenko is, after all, somebody who has a large uh, faction, I think about 20% of the right right now. Um, he's somebody looking for a popular mandate. He hasn't shown any intention yet to abandon more or less normal elections again. Let's remember that Yanukovych, um, when he came into power last time, actually did win a normal election, which is why the second revolution is also so much more complicated than the first one was, actually. We sort of tend to forget that, but we actually have to get rid of somebody who was in power legitimately to achieve not why that's, that's what it was, you know. And um, so I don't know. It's, it's, I guess that my guess is that Poroshenko is looking at opinion polls and is also telling people what they want to hear. But um, I, I wanted to say a few words about Crimea because, you know, the, the, a military option for Crimea, I think one of the best decisions Ukraine made in this crisis was not to fight in Crimea. I think that was perfectly right and it would have been much worse if they had done so. You also shouldn't forget that at the time when they didn't fight in Crimea, there was nothing of the armed forces and also volunteer battalions that they have now. They would have been crushed, quite simply. Um, the other thing is, What's Russia's position? Well, the Russians have just today started snap maneuvers in all the southern military districts uh, to show, you know, that they're ready for any sort of eventuality. That includes the North Caucasus, includes Crimea, and includes areas once again bordering on Ukraine. I wouldn't be alarmist about this, but I do think that Russia is absolutely not willing to give up on Crimea except on its own terms. Whatever those might be in the future, that might be, you know, who knows. Um, Poroshenko's take on this, on, on one side is very rational, because he has actually also said that we understand that we can't get Crimea back quickly. Um, we will get it back by making what we keep of Ukraine, which is most of it after all, so attractive economically, politically, and socially that it will fall into our hands, right? Which is partly, um, you know, what you've described, the strategy of disrupting or not providing electricity and so on, you could see that as the dark side of, of that sort of approach. That's, that's you know, that's not irrational at all. The problem is to make that work. Once again, we're hitting the economic modernization and reform wall. If that doesn't happen, you can't do the sort of, um, you know, uh, showcase or, or, you know, effect that, that obviously in, invokes. Um, yeah, that's really what I would kind of say. Could I uh, briefly um, add in there that um, the way in which Poland figures in this it's the word showcase that really triggers this. Um, it's, it's quite significant because Ambassador Limon invoked this contrast, this painful contrast between the state of Poland and Ukraine, which it's hard to imagine now that in 1991, as the Soviet Union collapsed, they had essentially the same level of GDP per capita, and they're now worlds apart. 
And part of that is a, is a positive story of reform and better governance. And part of that is enormous spending by the EU, utterly unprecedented spending by the EU. Um, and at precisely the same moment as the Ukrainian crisis escalates. So there's a resolution, I think, in 2013, 2014. The budget for Poland goes out to 106 billion euros, I think, down to 2020. So there is a commitment on the part of the EU for members or states which are going to exceed, which, which creates enormous, I think, false expectations on the part of states which are being offered association status or some more marginal uh, neighbourly relationship, where those kind of flows, are, their orders of magnitude out, right? In the, in the fall of 2013, the Commission, the EU was offering, I think, half a billion euros. Um, so radical disparity between the kind of spending that Brussels is capable of mobilising for members or future members and those in this, in this kind of this new world of, of neighbours that you don't love. And I think this is a, is a key problem in terms of communicating realistically about what is there. Because re structural reform with no feather bedding is a completely different story from structural reform when you're getting 17 billion euros a year, which is what Poland still now is getting, even in its current highly successful state. Right, but that's the major flow of the um, association agreement yeah. process, of course. It's uh, you're being asked to do all the efforts that is required also for candidate for accession without, at the moment, any prospect of membership. Um, because that's not part of the association agreement. In other words, do all the efforts and then we will see afterwards. Whereas with Poland and with all the other countries that became members in, in 2003, 4, 5, etc., um, this was written in the, uh, in the efforts that was asked of them. And of course, afterwards you have all the structural funds that come once you, once you are a member. But the difficulty, in my opinion, for someone like Poroshenko is precisely to sell all the efforts of uh, taking on board all the acquis communautaire through the association agreement, the norms, the standards that allow your, your country, if everything goes well, to become a modern economy, without being able to say that at the end of that process you will become a member of the European Union. And this contradiction is more than ever there because of precisely um, the uh, position taken by Russia and because of the division among the member states, the prospect of Ukraine um, becoming a member of the European Union seems to me to be further away than it ever was. Hmm. NATO. Yeah, so <coughs> I, I, mean, I would make the argument, and these states themselves would never make the argument, not with this president, that you know, one of the great or you know, say China was was a winner out of all this. I think the Baltic states are, are have gotten a lot of what they wanted to out of this president because of the Ukrainian crisis. And the irony here is that uh, Baltic commentators, uh, diplomats, uh, many of them don't particularly care for this regime because they view it as soft on Russia, as not being decisive enough, not providing defensive arms. But what Ukraine has done is it's emphasized the difference between being in NATO and out of NATO, right? So the U.S. is a global superpower, and part of that is managing what sociologists call this heterogeneity of relationships and contracts. Its obligations to NATO members are much different than its obligations to those states who aren't in it. And in some ways, the Ukraine crisis has forced Washington to sharpen those commitments. Prior to the Ukraine crisis, right, there were accusations that the U.S. Uh, wasn't interested in the transatlantic relationship anymore, um, that it was abandoning the Balts to pivot and rebalance over to the Philippines. You were getting all these kinds of inadvertent connections that were made. So actually, you know, this commitment has really sharpened what it has to do. Now, Article 5 doubts have sprung in my ever since the Georgia War. Right? So this isn't kind of you know a, a recent thing. There have been concerns, um, especially about what, you know, what would the German reaction be you know, to a play in, you know, in Latvia Estonia or some sort of, sort of a hybrid warfare or something. You know, how intense is the American commitment? I think as much as possible um, the administration has tried to dispel that, but 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 the optics of it aren't aren't I think appreciated. But I think you know their, their hands have, have, have been forced. Um, I've, I'll leave it at that. Just a couple things. Uh, one thing about yeah. um, I, I, I would like to address one, one problem that very often comes up. 
one, one really should remember that sovereignty of states does oh sovereignty of a state does not imply a natural right to be a NATO. You know that no, it, it's really important. You you hear President Poroshenko again, but many other Ukrainian commentators who again and again will say one day we will have a referendum and the Ukrainian people will decide on whether we will be in NATO or not. It's actually not the way NATO works. Quite literally, it doesn't work that way. NATO is a self-selective mutual defense club. And its, its security guarantee is historically unprecedentedly fierce and high. And there is a reason why it shouldn't stretch too far, because it really is a hair trigger. Right? If you really say that every attack on everybody is an attack on everybody else, then you are bound hand and foot to each other. And it's clear that that sort of commitment, if you make it loosely, it sooner or later will be doubted, uh, or you can end up in a terrible catastrophe. Right? Um, the other thing about NATO that is almost more forgotten is every NATO member has to make a credible defense to all others, including possibly one day Ukraine. NATO is actually not, I'm very sorry to be brutal about this, it's not Mother Teresa. It's not out there to defend anybody without them also making a strong contribution to the defense of all other NATO countries. Now, Ukraine has built its military forces throughout the war, which is admirable. It intends to spend 30% more in the current budget on the military than before. All of these are significant moves. But I, I don't see how this particular calculus actually works out to be reasonable for NATO. And NATO has a legitimate interest here too. NATO has no natural obligation to help <coughs> Ukraine simply and only because the Ukrainian people demand it, if they do. That's actually not a fact. But as powerful as that point is, it seems to me to beg a question which I know is key to uh, Ambassador Bimon's thinking about this question of European strategy, which is, is anyone else other than the United States in NATO making a credible commitment to any kind of security action, right? Why, why um, is it that the question is so polarized? And this is not a, this is not a, a, a critique of your personal position, but isn't that an absolutely core issue here, that the, that the boundary between NATO's inside and outside is incredibly stark, in part because the individual West European or Central European members of NATO have virtually no independent military functional capacity at this point. I mean, or, yes, I mean, it's treated to a level, certainly in the German case, which is historically remarkable. <laughs> Not since the days of the Holy Roman Empire have we seen Germany in the kind of military condition that it currently is today. And is that not one of the other questions that the EU has fundamentally baked now for 20 years since the end of the Cold War? 30 years. You're right, and you can go even further, I think, which is quite striking. We, we pretend that now inside the European Union, thanks to the Lisbon Treaty, we also have our own Article 5, which is Article 42.7. Um, which was used after the French, uh, the Paris attack, terrorist attack, and we've seen the result, which was even from the French point of view, that they were not, um, they applied for that article, but they were not very much interested in having some sort of collective defense or support. They were much more interested in having Germany taking over from France in Mali, some of the uh, military efforts there, so that the French could go on their own in, in, in Syria and put more of their forces into into Syria. So I think um, it's definitely we're very far away from what we thought was the natural scenario of an Article 5 in, in, in the European Union. And the same is true, of course, more, more than ever with regard to, to NATO and, and the lack of real military effort from, from on behalf of the European member states. I think we're all very much aware of that and we haven't seen much real difference at the moment. I'm tempted to say that after a really action-packed discussion, and I'd like to thank our speakers for their brevity, and the succinctness of their points, as well as the questions, the amount of material we've gotten through is really more than enough this evening. So can you please join me in thanking our panel?